Good morning, I'm Dennis Baker. Today I'm going to introduce the new edition of the Glenville Williams Dennis Baker Treatise of Criminal Law. This is the fifth edition of this work and the third edition that I've authored. The new edition is close to 2,500 pages, so it's been expanded significantly. I've written this over the last year and a half here at home in lockdown. And hopefully next week we'll all be back on campus, but I've not been back yet. Um, so uh, we're slowly getting out of this, uh, this lockdown period. The advantage of uh, the lockdown, believe it or not, for an academic is um, it allowed, well, at least allowed me to get on and do a lot more writing than I probably could have done uh, outside of lockdown. There's nothing else to do uh, when you're trapped at home and you can't travel, uh, fly to the US or Israel or China or anywhere. Um, so, what I've been able to do is add an additional 800 pages and reorient the book for the practice market. The book was always straddling between a student and a practice book, uh, cited uh, something like a thousand times in the appellate courts around the world um, over a very long period of time, so not, not much of that credit goes to me. But the, the book was struggling whether it's going to be which market to go for, and really it was too advanced for the student market. So, I decided to uh, focus on practice. Those picking up this book really will be those who have already got a criminal law, basic criminal law knowledge from uh, studying it or working in the field. Uh, academics, postgraduate students, barristers, they will benefit the most. Very able undergraduates, of course, will be able to dig into this and, and, and get a lot from it as well. But it's, it's not aimed for um, the general undergraduate market. The difference in doing a practice treatise and one for students is that all offences have to be covered in each of the areas. So if you're teaching, for example, um, from a student textbook, it might only cover the first four sections of the Sexual Offences Act as far as offences are concerned, and it might not look into all the children, offences uh, against children and so forth. Whereas a, a practice treatise has to cover all offences, um, including child pornography and extreme adult pornography, uh, all the sexual offences against children and those who are, are, are mentally incapacitated and so forth. So that's why the book has expanded significantly and it's not only necessary to cover all those offences because a practitioner needs to be able to pick up the book and find answers for whatever offence is coming onto their, their table. But they need to be covered very uh, carefully and in detail with proper referencing and also drawing on comments from the judiciary. Uh, and it, it's, it needs to be much more thorough than what's necessary in a student textbook. So that's why it's um, expanded. That's why it's a, a, a large book now. It cannot be helped um, because the sheer range of offences that need to be covered and the great detail in which they need to be covered in and a detail that's not possible in procedure books. And the primary focus of the book is substantive criminal law. The new first chapter deals with the history of English criminal law and looks at subject of fault and that's quite important because it informs discussions throughout the book. For example, in chapter 14, the discussion on gross negligence manslaughter and unlawful dangerous act manslaughter. The arguments I put forward there is to try to show the history supports a subjective reading of gross negligence manslaughter and also that unlawful dangerous act manslaughter requires foresight that the unlawful dangerous act will cause serious injury. So that's what that first chapter is about, the history of subjective fault back to Bracton and, and before, and it tries to set up a foundation for um, subjective arguments throughout. The, uh, most of the chapters are chapters that were in the previous editions, except for they've been expanded to cover many more offences, 
So in, in the case of chapters that are dealing with special power offences, the um, main addition to this book is the part six on white collar crime, because there's six new chapters there. And this again is important to those in practice. What's covered in those chapters, chapter 39 deals with company and insolvency offences, the cartel offence, financial offences, market manipulation, benchmark manipulation. That's followed by a new chapter on bribery and misconduct in public office. That chapter has quite a bit of a theoretical discussion about the grey area of corruption, the black area and the white area of corruption. And it's quite important because a great deal of what's not considered to be a bribe or misconduct in public office is actually in a grey area where really a careful interpretation would show uh, it is criminal conduct. Peddling influence, for example, using friendship bribes. These are things that really shouldn't be pushed into the grey or white area of corruption, but should be treated as black corruption. I try to make um, some, case, some sort of theoretical and uh, normative case um, for that in that chapter, as well as go through the letter of the law and those offences. But because that raises such interesting normative questions, it was a slightly more interesting chapter to write than some of the other chapters, for example, tax offences. The uh, book also includes chapters on copyright offences and trademark offences, and followed by a chapter on cybercrime and, uh, cybercrime and artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is an important issue with respect to financial crimes, front running the market, high frequency traders, the algorithms they use for that, um, artificial intelligence could be counted as articles for use in fraud under Section 6 or 7 of the Fraud Act 2006, or we might need a new offence. But that's important because artificial intelligence is going to be used more and more by criminals, including uh, white collar criminals. Then that is followed by the, those two chapters are followed by the tax offence chapters, which looks at export and import um, customs offences, as well as tax offences and social security offences. And the final chapter in the new part six is the chapter 44 dealing with money laundering, the proceeds of crime act. And again, in that chapter, um, technology comes up because uh, I have to try and determine whether one can uh, uh, be in possession of crypto assets for the purpose of the Proceeds of Crime Act. And to do that, you need to understand the uh, nature of the financial transactions and nature of the technology, uh, as well as uh, the law. And you have to outline all that to be able to apply the law carefully. So throughout the book, there's a mix of history, theory and technology. And these are interlinked to try and make sound arguments about where the law uh, ought to be and how it ought to be interpreted in cases and practice on a daily basis. Thank you.